Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Quay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Tonight, my very special guest is Priscilla Vogelbacher. Priscilla is the author of the book, Hallowed Be Thy Name, Lucifer, Origins, and Revelation. She is a researcher and an expert in the mythologies of the Mesopotamia and the Abrahamic religions, focusing on the character and concept of Lucifer. In today's discussion, Priscilla will take us to the Sumerian story of Enki and Enlil to help us understand who's the true god of human enlightenment. Is it Yahweh or is it Lucifer? And to kick our conversation off, I asked Priscilla if she could help define what mythology means from a researcher's perspective. And here is what she had to say. Mythology is a lot more complex than people like to give it credit for. And to fully understand things accurately, you have to go to the details. You have to look up the meanings of certain words to get the correct meaning of it. A lot of people approach this subject, not just mythology as a whole, but specifically the Genesis story and and the Abrahamic deities with a lot of bias, a lot of prejudice. You know, religion, popular religion likes to keep each other segregated. Uh, But if you want to understand the mythology of it, you can't take that approach if you just look to the Bible or just look to the Quran or whatever text you use, you're not going to get the real story. You're just going to get uh, one version of the story. But each version is a piece of a larger aggregate. So um, like I said, you can't just take one story at face value uh, because it won't make any sense. Like a lot of atheists, for example, these days love to poke fun at the Genesis story Um, because, you know, it's very easy to do if you just read the Bible for what it is. But when you incorporate other beliefs like Islam, like Gnosticism, like uh, the ancient beliefs from Babylon and going all the way back to Sumer, it it makes a lot more sense because these older myths have uh, a very elaborate uh, take on these events that uh, apparently happened because people up to the 17th century uh, saw mythology as uh, prehistory and it was very commonly held to be uh, a widespread belief before Darwinism took over. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%, Priscilla, that people today view mythology as they're just stories. That's it. You know, these things never happened. When they hear a myth or they read about it, they think in terms of um, it's just good storytelling. And yeah, a lot of people like to dismiss it out of hand, like a knee jerk reaction. Oh, those are just fairy tales. They're just, you know, simple stories to tell kids. They they might have uh, it might be a metaphor for learning a certain lesson or so, but. There are a lot more than that. And the amount of detail that's provided in these stories uh, has led me to believe that they there's some truth here. There's there's definitely a truth here that this possibly actually happened at some point in our history. To say all mythology can be uh, explained away through astrotheology, which is, you know, the study of the stars, the worship of the stars, the planets, etc., I think that's far too simple an explanation. And also, if you read books that try to explain it, they go to enormous lengths to try to fit everything into the stars themselves. You really got to make an effort for it. But if you take the stories as stories, to me, it makes more sense. And it's a lot easier also. So do you have the belief that taking mythology and making it or turning it into storytelling as an example, is this something, Priscilla, in your mind that was intended? In other words, it's a systematic approach to suppress that information? Well, maybe, but then the question is who's doing the suppressing and why? And that's a whole other topic. But, you know, Carl Jung the world-renowned psychologist, he said that uh, primitive men did not invent myths, they experienced them, which goes back to this concept of mythology being a record of prehistory. That's not a concept I deal with at length in this uh, first book, but 
it is something I'm going to expand on more in the second book that I'm working on. Why do you think they would want to suppress mythology? Well, if there were people suppressing it, let me phrase it that way, why would they do that? I could only speculate. I don't know the answer to that. But through my research, I, I think it's about disguising who the gods are or were, whether or not they're still alive, um, where they are, who knows. But it's also to keep people segregated, I think, to keep strife going on Earth, to keep people divided, because that creates enduring conflict. And when people are divided, they don't rise up against the oppressors. So that's a really great tool to keep people in line or out of the business of those in charge, the elites, the governments, etc. So it sounds like it would be an effort to suppress the, the true understanding of human origins. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I would agree with you on that, that I think there's a lot of suppression of not just mythology, but history in general, in order to keep people off balance and to keep them away from the truth. And so uh, I think that's what we're faced with. So maybe what we can do, Priscilla, if you'd like, as I mentioned to you before we got started, that I'm going to give you the floor here to talk about whatever it is you'd like to talk about. So on the list that you sent me in the email of the topics for today's call, some of it, uh, we'll get to most of it, I guess. And if we don't, we will have um, have you come back and do a part three. Where would you like to start? Um, well, we, we started with some of the story in the last show, didn't we? Yes. Okay. Where did we end there? Where did we get cut off? I remember the last part of the show, we were talking, uh, we got into Lucifer being Jesus, Jesus being Lucifer. I, I recall that. Yeah. And I said that that was going to raise a couple of eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could go over that really briefly okay, for yeah, anybody yeah. who's who's saying, wait a minute. Yeah, the most glaring... Uh, Proof of that is uh, the end of the book of Revelation 22, 16. Jesus says that he is the morning star. And if you read Isaiah, uh, it says that Lucifer is the son of the morning, the Hela ben Shahar in Hebrew. And so if they're both the morning star, that means they are the same entity. That's the most basic explanation I can give. And then that gets into the planet Venus, and um, and then, but Venus is a goddess, so is is Lucifer a goddess? And I say yes. And you know, section two is all about this in my book, uh, making these uh, connections between goddesses and gods, and who they are, and what the concepts are. And um, I, I call the great goddess Lucifera, which is uh, the feminine Lucifer. But that, that can be a whole other show. But everything is explained in Section 2 for anybody who cares to learn about that. Okay, so maybe before we get into this, too, maybe we can explain a little bit more about why Lucifer isn't evil. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of evidences, uh, some of which are in the story itself. I call this book a thesis of mine uh, to show that Lucifer is our creator, savior, and God. And in the story, he is our creator because he is equated with the Sumerian god Enki, who in the Babylonian and Sumerian myths is the creator of humanity. And we have to go back to Sumeria for most of the answers, because that's the original story. And that's, you know, if you want, if you ever play the the game telephone as a kid in class, um, the teacher will whisper in the first kid's ear something, and it'll go around the room. And by the last kid, the message will be completely different from the first. And the same happened with the spread of myth and legend from Sumer throughout the Middle East to Greece to uh, the Norselands to India, etc., in all these directions, these mythologies became something else over time. Uh, and to, to the point where when you get to Greek mythology, you're imagining these uh, deities who look just like humans, who are, you know, Zeus is some old man with a flowing beard who throws lightning bolts at people from the clouds. 
And that's pretty much been the uh, general concept, the popular concept of what God is supposed to look like in, in mass media and in, in uh, popular thought. But that's it's just ludicrous. There's no basis for that whatsoever. When you go back to the Sumerian myths, you find not only were they they didn't look like that. They weren't even human. The gods were not a race of human beings. The study of the history of myth is called euhemerism. And that's named after this guy, Euhemeros, who in the 4th century BC was a mythographer in the court of the king Cassander of Macedon. And he's the one credited for bringing mythology into a historic perspective, hence the term. But <laughs> what I've done is taken the descriptions of uh, the biblical and extra biblical descriptions of the gods, what they look like, because I'm by trade, I am a traditional artist. I, I draw a lot. Uh, I have painted. So I'm interested in visuals and not only getting the story correct, but, you know, what did everything look like? How is the atmosphere, the characters, the settings, etc.? So I took all these descriptions and came to the conclusion that they were a race of demonic dragon beings. And by dragons, I don't mean literal dragons like we see in movies and shows like Game of Thrones and, and such. What I mean by that is they were they looked like a cross between what we look like, modern humans, and a traditional depiction of a dragon, like in Beowulf or whatever. So would that be like a reptilian? It would be a reptilian, yeah. And I call it I call them <clears throat> demonic because they have uh, demonic attributes, uh, physical attributes that are attributed to demons in monotheism, like horns, wings, membranous wings. Not all of them had these things. Uh, their skin was bright. They were albino, but they had a bluish, greenish hue to them. But not all of them were, they look, they didn't look all the same. It's like uh, human beings, you know, you and I look different. We sound different because we're different people. It's the same thing. They were a race unto themselves. And, uh, the, and they had, uh, it seems that they had a primitive style, uh, what we would consider primitive style of hierarchy. The strong were on top, the uh, intelligent were on top, but you had to have a combination of these two. And like I said, the ones with the horns, the ones with the wings, they were uh, usually the ones in the major pantheon. I call it the major pantheon. It's the Council of Twelve that everybody knows about. And the minor pantheon, as I call it, is pretty much all the other gods, the lesser gods, the lower deities. And the lower ones didn't didn't necessarily have wings. But in the Haggadah text, the Jewish mytho mythological text, it does specify that Lucifer had 12 wings instead of six like all the others. So that's a very visually obvious uh, form of status. Now, Priscilla, you mentioned demons, and there were going to be folks because of the traditional training, I'll yes. call it, of religion. Demons are going to be perceived as evil. So when you right. talk about demonic in the context in which you just explained it, is it evil? Uh, yes and no. Uh, you know, they have, as a race uh, unto themselves, they do have emotions and they can be good or evil. They have the capacity to do that within themselves, just like we do. It's no different. So through their actions, uh, we decide whether somebody is good or evil. Because I can tell you that I'm the best person on earth, and you might believe that, but if I go and kill somebody in cold blood, are you going to believe it then? Probably not, you know. So, like the gospel says, a tree is judged by its fruits. The same is applied to the gods, not just us. People are going to say, oh, it's just evil. So what you're saying is, no, it's not. It depends right. on who that person or that being is. Right. And uh, listeners need to do away with the notion that there are such things as angels and demons in the traditional sense. 
These are just terms to distinguish between factions of good and evil in concept, but it's really just two opposing views, two opposing sides. For example, uh, Yahweh with his League of Angels and Satan with his army of demons, right? That's the traditional depiction that people get in their heads. What this is, is actually just just different terms. Like uh, if there was a war between China and Russia, you know, who could say who's good and who's evil? It's a matter of perspective, right? Demons and angels are just terms. What about Yahweh? That you just pause for a second now. Yeah, Yahweh, Jehovah, the mm -hmm. same. Yeah, Yahweh, Jehovah, and Allah are the same deity, and uh, Satan, Iblis, and Lucifer are the same deity. Now, Luciferians and Satanists love to go on about how Lucifer and Satan are different, and esoterically, I can agree with that. They are different, but if you're looking at the narrative, you have to make sense of this. And to, if you're going to say they're different deities, then you're going to make it a lot harder on yourself than it needs to be. So you have to make these connections. I have heard that where there is a distinction between Satan and Lucifer. So what you're saying is in reality, there's not? No, I'm saying uh, esoterically there is a difference, but exoterically there is not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So what's the difference esoterically? Esoteric uh, is hidden meanings. We see this in everything, like modern and 20th century interpretation of myth. It basically depreciates myth into metaphors and euphemisms. These are esoteric explanations. In Freemasonry, the rituals and ceremonies use deities and mythological motifs to incorporate into their rituals. And this is an esoteric interpretation of things, um, whether it suits their needs or not is a different matter. But an exoteric is more literal. It's more a more literal, pragmatic interpretation of it. It's taking it more at face value. At the same time, uh, extinguishing all the nonsense, the superstitions, because you have to recognize these things. Uh, mythology uh, and religious texts is it's intertwined with all the precepts and divine laws and, and um, allegories and everything else in these books. So to know what is a myth and what is a divine teaching, uh, you have to be attuned to being able to distinguish between these things and not confuse the two and not uh, equate the two either. Now, going back to Yahweh, Jehovah, mm. uh, in the Gnostic teachings... Yahweh Jehovah would be the demiurge. Yeah, the demiurge is a con, you know, world creator is different from the Euhemerus uh, deities. If we're going to say they were uh, a race, like I do for the narratives, then the concept of the demiurge is something quite different from that. You and I don't have the capacity to create a planet. You know, we ourselves cannot do this. And it's the same with the gods. The concept of the Demiurge is different. And it's different because this gets into um, like the end of all that is, was, and ever will be. This is the concept of the true God that I, I get into at the very end of my book. Because by definition, God is a concept that cannot be understood, which is, you know, why there is a concept. I call it this energy at the beginning of everything um, is a neutral energy. It has no direct relationship with anything. It makes no decisions upon anything. It just uh, it's a primal energy from which everything sprang and solar systems came from stars, etc., etc. Would we say that the Demiurge is the creator of the material world? Yeah, the third dimension, the plane of matter. The Gnostics uh, viewed matter as evil, and it makes a lot of sense because the opposite, like if we imagine heaven to be an ethereal place, uh, another dimension, if you will, then the opposite of light is matter. And so if light is heaven and heaven is good, then evil would be the realm of matter. It would be the third dimension. It, it would be earth as far as we know. Yeah, that's a very good way to explain it. I haven't heard it that way where you would, yeah. you're comparing it between light and matter. 
So then, and this is just for my own edification, so I, I will stop getting in my own way here in a minute. <laughs> so when we talk about the Demiurge, Lucifer would be, let's just say, in a hierarchy of gods above the Demiurge? No, I, I don't incorporate the Demiurge in a hierarchy. It's mm -hmm. something apart from it entirely. It's a it's a different concept. I don't call it any one deity. It's it's the great goddess uh, as an esoteric principle. Okay, I'm not sure so I you got can, that. <laughs> well, you can call it Sophia, Isis. Uh, I call it Lucifera as an umbrella term. You can call it anything you want. But uh, one of the points I make in my book is that God derives from goddess. That's the great big reveal of section two of my book. And so, therefore, uh, this divine energy, or call it divine, call it neutral, whatever, at the beginning of everything, it would have to be labeled more feminine than masculine, even though I would say it's neither. It's genderless, in, in essence. But, you know, if you have to give it a gender, it's more female, because the female is the one that gives birth to things. Okay, so Sophia is not the demiurge, right? Is that what you're saying? Right. Okay. But she created the Demiurge based upon the Gnostic teachings. That's my understanding. Yeah, that's the purely Gnostic take on it. And yeah. his his name was, uh, he goes by different names, Ialdabaoth, uh, Sakha, uh, I think, which means fool. Uh, in Egypt, uh, as far as I understand, it's Mat. It's, that's the closest okay. thing. Okay, okay, got it. Mm -hmm. In Sumerian, uh, her name is Mumu, and this is... Like I said, it's apart from the hierarchy. Okay, very interesting. Okay, so I, I've taken up way too much of your time trying to get myself on board <laughs> with <laughs> some okay. of those things. So. Uh, one more thing before we get into the story. Yeah. The, the gods themselves have a lot of different titles people need to understand. Uh, in uh, Hebrew, it's Elohim, which uh, at the beginning when it says let us create man in our image and in our likeness. The Hebrew word is Elohim, which is plural, gods and or goddesses. It's male and female in one. So it, it's, it's never one deity. Um, it's always a group of deities. And in the Gnostics uh, texts, they called them archons, and they viewed the gods as a evil beings. And uh, the head, Ialdabaoth, he was arrogant, he was narcissistic, uh, and this is the Yahweh, this is the Allah of the Gnostics. In uh, Sumerian mythology, they were called the Anunnaki, and then there was a worker uh, class of the Anunnaki called the Agigi that were under uh, Enlil's command. Enlil is the Sumerian Yahweh. And the Anunnaki were under Enki's command, and Enki was the Sumerian Satan. So, like I said, the uh, distinguishing and identifying deities is something that I, I spent a great deal of time on and is the entirety of Section 2 of my book. But it's, it's necessary to understand so that you understand who these deities are so that the story in Section 3 makes sense. You know, I'm going to buy your book. I, I'm so loaded up on books, and um, <laughs> I am. I have so many books, but I'm, I'm going to buy your book because this is just too fascinating. But the one last question for you, Priscilla, before we get going here. Um, you said that you have done these drawings or these paintings of these beings? Uh, not of the beings specifically. I Not yet, at least. I oh, okay. Plans, okay. But... I thought maybe you were saying that you did. I was going to say if you have copies or prints, I could put them into the slideshow, but if you haven't done them, then... <laughs> They won't be in yeah, the slideshow. Not yet. I'm a portrait artist, um, but I haven't gotten around to that yet. So. Okay. Okay. No mm -hmm. problem. All right. So, I, like I said, I've taken up a lot of your time there, a half an hour of the show. But where would you like to go next? If we could start from the beginning, uh, the reasons why we were created, or we can uh, jump around, or we can just start somewhere else. One of the things you had here, which I thought was very interesting, was the concept of the Golden Age. Is that a good place to start or no? Yeah, sure. Okay. The Golden Age is this uh, idea that people have of a time that was filled with affluence, technological affluence, perhaps um, moral uh, superiority, 
Uh, life was great. You didn't have to work or toil for anything. Everything was provided. Everything was free. Some people believe it's this time where money didn't exist. There's a lot of different takes on what it was or what it could have been. I use the examples given by Hesiod and Ovid. What they say uh, when you look at them, is they, they provide five different races of humans. And the Golden Age was the first race, and then the silver, the bronze. Uh, one of them has a heroic age, which was uh, more like demigods. And, and then in a race of iron. And we are the race of iron, the last one. And what you see is uh, a technological progress through the ages, through the races. But at the same time, you see a moral degradation in sync with that. So as technology gets better and better, people's moral standing was lowered and lowered and lowered, which kind of makes sense because if, if you know, today we have unreal capabilities going uh, to the furthest reaches of the heavens, the cosmos with probes, and we can blow each other up into extinction if we had the right events happening to do that. But you know, how are people treating each other these days? Not that well, from what I've seen. But as technological progress increases, uh, moral standing goes down. And that's that's what these show. And But the Golden Age, according to Ovid and Hesiod, well, it's, it sounds more like the time before civilization, before modern humans. Uh, when we were supposedly still apes munching on bananas in the forests, because later on, its mythology records, the gods came in and they created us. Now, why did they create us? There's a lot of events that lead up to that. And like I said, there was this uh, faction of Anunnaki called the Agiki, and they were a worker race, and they toiled in the mines of the Abzu. And the Abzu, if anybody is familiar with Zechariah Sitchin, thinks, oh, it's Southeast Africa, but that's not what it is. The word Abzu means nether sea. So they were toiling in mines under the waters. What waters that is, uh, we don't know for sure, because no text speci specifies where that is on Earth. Could have been the Atlantic Ocean, it could have been the Mediterranean, uh, it could have been the Gulf of Persia, we don't know. But based on the word itself, we do know that it was not East Africa. It was underwater somewhere. And there was this underwater dragon goddess, her name was Tiamat, and she was in charge of things. And she had a uh, army of what's known as chaos monsters which were these uh, amphibious uh, hybrid creatures. They, they toiled in the mines for a while. Uh, some texts say thousands of years, some say hundreds. We don't know for sure, but it was for quite a long time. They dug out canals, they formed rivers, they built cities and temples. In the Canaanite mythology, it describes them building the temple for Yam, and Yam is Enki, in the Canaanite mythology, Ea in Akkadian, Poseidon in Greece, etc. Now, were these temples this, above ground or below? Well, Yam's temple, Yam's temple was at the uh, ocean floor. And, and it also describes the temple building of uh, Baal's place of residence as well. And his was on a mountain. This is interesting to me because there's been a lot of archaeology that has been found in the ocean where they say, oh, these are sunken cities and so mm -hmm. on, sunken civilizations. But I'm thinking that, well, maybe they weren't sunken. Maybe they were there. That's where they were. I mean, is that something that's outrageous to think? <laughs> no, not at all, because uh, the gods were a, a kind of amphibious uh, dragon race. So it... It does make sense in that way. They would be able to breathe underwater. So um, after a while, they got sick of m mining and uh, doing the hard labor. And they went to Enlil's temple and demanded that something be done. And that's why we were created. And there was a fight between Tiamat, because she was gearing up to use her army 
and Marduk was appointed. And Marduk was Enki's firstborn son. And he was the hero. And he took his, uh, his bow and quiver and his mace and battled Tiamat one-on-one -on -one combat, and he won. And then they used Enki and this womb goddess, Bela Ely, who's also known as Ninursag or Anat, depending on the mythology you read. He and her, those two, uh, decided to create us. And they took the body of the guy who started the rebellion. And his name was, uh, again, depending on the mythology or the text, uh, the Atrahasis text called him Wi'ila, um, or Geshtu'i. The Babylonian Anuma Elish called him Kingu, or in Sumerian, Kinguku. And his name means unskilled laborer, which is probably a slanderous way of uh, calling him uh, a rebellious slave. And they took him, they killed him, made an example of him, used his blood, or DNA rather, and spliced it with this creature who was already here, which was uh, our descendant, ancestor. Okay, so let me just make sure I, I summarize a little bit here, uh, Priscilla, so I can get my own head wrapped around it. So Tiamat and Marduk had this battle. Yes. Marduk was the, the offspring of Enlil? Enki. Of Enki. Okay, of Enki. Yes. So this would be the good god, right? Yes, Enki is is the uh, more benevolent of the two. Right, and and Enlil would be more of the would be Yahweh. Right. So Marduk wins this battle, beats Tiamat. Right. Yes. Okay. What would have happened if Tiamat had had won that battle? Well, I imagine uh, labor the labor force would have grown. They probably would have taken more Anunnaki and put them into the Agigi faction and probably stepped up the mining operations. Okay, and, so uh, they would have continued to have been, quote-unquote, enslaved to that mining. Yeah. The gods themselves were not happy about what was happening. The Council of Twelve, the Pantheon Major, as I call them, they like things to go smoothly. They don't, they don't like rebellion. They don't like uh, things getting too out of hand. They like control. They like things going their way at all times. And if something doesn't go according to plan, then things really hit the fan. Okay. Know? Well, things haven't changed very much then. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, Enlil was shaken by this. He was in tears over what was happening because he just, he was in disbelief. And, you know, Enki says, well, there is this creature that exists and we can take this creature and change him using the DNA of this other slain person and create this worker to relieve the Yigi of their toil. Okay. So then he's going to say, well, we're going to create, in essence, a subspecies. Right. To be able to take on this work. Okay. Right. And um, in the creation of Adam, there's some uh, textual evidences to explicitly state that he and Eve were a uh, mammalian saurian hybrid originally, which goes back to the gods being a reptilian race, an amphibious reptilian race. So um, they did this, and there was a lot of trial and error. Uh, one person couldn't stop shaking. Their ribs was, were twisted. Another person was blind. Another had deformities. Um, there was retardation. Somebody had no bladder control. Another experiment uh, had a closed throat, couldn't breathe. Another was completely crippled. And on and on it goes. There was a lot of trial and error. Now, where did uh, you get this information from? Because that's a lot of detail about their yeah. mistakes. Yeah, it's a Sumerian text called The Birth of Man. Okay. And it, it details uh, this specifically. And after all these trial and errors, they finally came up with a race, uh, and the Mayans knew of them as the race of wood. And I determined that the word wood is a code word for severe jaundice. Their skin was so brittle uh, that it resembled wood. And uh, but they they didn't last because they couldn't. They were in such misery they couldn't, as the text they um, recognize the gods. They didn't praise them. But really, they, they couldn't function as normal people. So they were destroyed. But the Mayan Paul Paul Vu says that it, they were destroyed by a flood of resin. 
And you have to say, if these events took place in the Middle East, and this is where geographically I placed this be- just to make it easier uh, to understand, then how would a flood of resin happen in that area? And you have to go all the way back to the last super volcano, the last caldera explosion, uh, which was Mount Toba in Indonesia between 67 and a half to 77,000 years ago. So this is the time period in which I placed this to explain these details. Now, uh, we could talk about Atlantis later. Uh, I don't get into it too much in my first book. But if, let's say, uh, it took place on Atlantis or Lemuria, things would be a lot different. And then we'd have to, you'd have to explain it in, in those terms, too, which is something that I, I would like to get into in a, a second book. But assuming that it took place in the Middle East, I'd have to go back to Mount Toba to explain that. So around 70,000 years ago, give or take. And once that race, the race of wood was destroyed, there was a little more experimentation, but then uh, the first prototype, Adam, was created. And he was perfect. He was too perfect, actually, because he, he was able to understand like the gods. He could see far distances, and he was just too good of a success and some of the angels wanted him dead because of it and they tried to kill him by burning him but it didn't work and uh, Enki put him under again and basically dumbed him down using neurosurgery and then once he was dumbed down he was placed in the garden and Eden the garden of Eden was an enclosed structure and I believe it was domed a domed enclosed garden of the gods if you will. And there's a few things that I can point out right now to indicate that it was a dome structure. There's uh, in Genesis, when uh, Yahweh was giving his uh, condemnation, uh, he says, um, it shall yield you brambles and thistles and with sweat on your brow shall you eat your bread. Uh, You know, that's saying you have to work for what you need now. And one of the lines says, you will grow weary and not rest, be afflicted with bitterness and not taste sweetness, be oppressed by heat and burdened by cold, you will toil much and not gain wealth, etc. So this line, be oppressed by heat and burdened by cold, this tells us that they didn't have to go through this in the garden, which means it was temperature controlled. And it also in the Quran we read um, of the garden and its provisions. It says, And that thou art not thirsty therein, nor exposed to the sun's heat. So how would they not be exposed to the sun if it was not an enclosed structure that was roofed over? Now this is uh, different they, than the, the, uh, the firmament in the Bible then, right? This is right. a different, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. The firmament is something totally different. Okay. Basically, our atmosphere is the firmament. It's called the first heaven also. I believe it was a domed uh, greenhouse. And he named the animals, and everybody knows the story. I'm going to go through this part really quick because it's very well known. Uh, He went through the naming of animals where each one came up in pairs, and then afterwards he realized he doesn't have a counterpart. And he got sad, and he wanted one, so... And he goes back, creates the first woman, who was Lilith. She was the first successful prototype female. And she was put in there, but she wanted equality with him. Uh, but he didn't want that. So she escaped to the Red Sea. And uh, Yahweh and Lil sent three emissaries to her to retrieve her, but she refused. And off she went. Because of Lilith's rebellion, Enlil wanted to make sure that she would be submissive. So what happened was Eve immediately was gang raped by, uh, in the Gnostic scriptures, uh, Yaldabaoth and his angels, uh, who is Yahweh Enlil and uh, some other gods. So she was placed in the garden after that. After getting married to Adam, they had a very opulent uh, ceremony for that. 
And then they were there in the garden to tend it and to live as basically, uh, you know, statues or prizes. Basically, they were trophies to show off the yeah. their uh, you know their achievement of being able to put these beings together. Exactly. Yeah. And in the creation, there there wasn't just one or and two. Uh, you know, Adam and Eve are singled out because they were the first successful prototypes, fully successful uh, in the gods' eyes. There was actually 14 womb goddesses present in the process, and they gave birth to seven males and seven females. But it was a process. It wasn't all of a sudden, there's Adam. You know, everybody knows Satan comes in, tempts Eve. And let, let me get into this, actually, a little bit, because there's some details that are important in this in particular. He climbs over uh, one of the walls of the enclosure to sneak in because it was guarded and Lil appointed uh, his angels to guard it. He goes up to Eve. He pushes her against the tree after speaking with her to show her that she would not die by touching the tree because that's what Yahweh said. You know, if you even touch it, you're going to get killed. Uh, and she believed it. But so he pushes her to show her that she wouldn't. And then... He, he does this reverse psychology. He's like, oh, you want the fruit? No, I'm not. I'm actually not going to give it to you. He denies her, which made her want it even more. So he makes her take an oath. He says, all right, if you want this, you have to give it to Adam too. And she says, okay. And so he bends the branch of the tree, takes the fruit, gives it to her. She eats a piece of the skin and then after, you know, a sudden panic attack, <laughs> she realizes she's not dead. And then she takes a bite. And she realizes she's not dead after she took a bite. So she she gets really scared. She gives it to Adam because she thinks she's going to die anyways. Um, and then in a cute burst of naivete, she also gives it to the animals to eat because she wants them all to be together. Uh, if they all died together because you know that's the only life she ever known and the animals are part of her family so he said uh, Satan said to her your minds are going to be opened that's actually in a Gnostic text the origin of the world uh, chapters 119 and so Satan is Enki right yes okay Satan is Enki I just want to keep the the audience kind of together along with myself <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Actually, his words, let me read a verse to you if I can. In the Apocalypse of Moses, chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, he says to her, May God live, for I am grieved over you that you are like animals, for I do not want you to be ignorant, but rise, come and eat, and observe the glory of the tree. So he doesn't want, he didn't want them to be ignorant because they were his creation. They're, they're his children, you know. And he wanted more for them. Going back to um, all the trial and errors before Adam was created, even though these people had deformities and, and all these uh, horrible things wrong with them, Enki wanted to give them a life. And they gave, he gave them a purpose, despite their shortcomings. So he's very, um, you know, he has people's best interests at heart, I believe. And according to the texts, He's he's really a munificent leader. He's he's really generous, and he he wants the best for his creations. Right? This is so diametrically opposed to <laughs> how people understand this story that it's it's striking. So oh, I just yeah. wanted I just wanted to mention that yeah, because I know folks are probably listening and saying this is completely not what we've been taught. It's the other oh, way yeah. around, right? It, I mean, where Yahweh Enlil is the benevolent. God and man, it's just amazing. Right. And that's why the uh, connections between the deities in section two of my book is so important to understand, because if you don't get it, then the story is not going to make a whole lot of sense, I don't think. But it's well worth the effort, trust me, because the story is just explosive. So the tree itself, I believe, was uh, the fruit of the tree, rather. It was uh, magic mushrooms. And in particular, the Amanita muscaria mushroom. And there are some verses, like I said, their minds opened. Uh, that was the origin of the world. 
You open his mind was chapter 111 of that text. You'll become like gods. That's echoed in Jubilees. Your eyes will open. And what do people say when they've just been um, shocked into some some revelation, right? Some truth that made so much sense, but like, oh, how could I have missed that? You know, like people say they're awake. Yeah, right? They say that's an eye opener, right? Right. That's an eye opener. Right. And it's the same thing. This is also the the divine fire which Prometheus stole from the gods to give to humans. It's the same concept wrapped up in this myth. Fire, uh, it was believed in mythology, fire is something considered stored up in trees. And uh, the fruit is said to have been in the tree, although if it was magic mushrooms, it would have been growing either on the tree or at the base. And if you read the Colburn Bible, which is a Celtic Egyptian book, in that account, there's something called the Lotus of Rapture that uh, grew at the base of the tree. So it's it's the same thing in a, a different way of telling it. And um, so there's this Satan Prometheus uh, being in this myth here, which is the same as Quetzalcoatl in the Paul Paul Vu. His name in there is Tohil. And uh, after he gave them fire, he says, quote, Very well, certainly I am your God, so shall it be. I am your Lord, so let it be. So, you know, he is the one that gave us knowledge. He is the one that freed us from a life of ignorance and thraldom. He is the, one, he is the reason, according to this myth, that we are uh, extra, or we are the homo sapiens, the wise man, the or the antiquated term homo sapiens sapiens extra wise that also gets into the concepts the hindu nirvana the third eye chakra the serpentine kundalini energy through meditation in the spine um like buddha meditated under a tree to reach nirvana and uh it's the same principle at work here very interesting priscilla um <laughs> I'm just uh, amazed here. Um, even talking about the the magic mushrooms, expanded consciousness. You know, this is all yeah, stuff today a... that we're, we're we're trying to re-explore, right? These are things today we're still trying to understand. Yeah, and uh, this is, I think, a big reason why uh, magic mushrooms are illegal in our society. You, you know, they do expand the mind, and even though I don't state this in the book. Uh, there's been scientific evidence to show that magic mushrooms actually make your brain hyper-connected. So it does benefit you physically, not just psychologically. We still have Enlil or Yahweh's presence keeping us from expanding, oh, yeah. keeping us from being what we what we really could be, right? Oh, yes, definitely. Adam refused to repent after that because Enlil came in and he says, if you would just repent, you can stay in here. But he refused. And so they got thrown out. A security system got put in place to keep them out or to keep anybody else who wanted to get in out. And uh, in, in the Colburn Bible, it, it describes the flaming sword, the cherubim and the flaming sword as tongues of light with many flickering hues and flames that reach to the sky, it, like a uh, prismacolor spectrum. It was really something to see. So Adam begs to be let in to get the fruit after a while because things as they are and human nature what it is after you get over yourself you want you realize your own mistakes which is what happened to him and he begs to be let in and the angels uh they don't let him in and he, he wanted spices he said i don't even want the fruit just give me some spices at least which here's here's something that's really interesting about this uh they made a tent, mourned for a whole week, a whole seven days without eating anything. This means they, whatever they were eating in the garden sustained them for that long and even longer because after, after the week, Eva, Eva was suicidal. She decided to wander around for food and she did that for nine days and, uh, or Adam did, sorry. And then after that, uh, Adam came up with the idea, well, we're not going to be forgiven. So I, I think we need to do something to do this. So he came up with the brilliant idea of standing in the Jordan River while Eve stood in the Tigris River. And they were to stand there for 40 days in order to show that they were 
they uh, regretted what they did. And on the 19th day, Satan comes to Eve and he goes up to her and he coaxes her out of that because it was ridiculous, you know, um, and takes her, carries her over to Adam and Adam freaks out and, you know, says, why are you doing this? Why are you still following us? And, and he sighs, Satan sighs and says, you know, all, all of my, all of my suffering is with you. And you just, basically they had no idea because they didn't have any idea. And, and for some odd reason, Satan did not tell them, uh, we, we don't know why that's left to speculation. Maybe it was, um, uh, Maybe the council decided that he was not to tell them, or maybe we we just don't know. Enki doesn't have the upper hand here. It's it sounds like Enlil, oh, yeah. who's Yahweh, has the upper hand, and it's almost as if Enki, who is Satan, is kind of trying to navigate around his brother, right? Exactly, his brother, right? To try to see what he can do. But the distinct feeling I'm getting as you're telling this story is there's not parity between the two. Am I misinterpreting that? No, you know, you, you got it pretty much on point there. You know, Enlil was the head of the council. Enki uh, was second in command. Yeah, it's good to be so yeah. even Yeah. <laughs> even <laughs> though he had power and influence, he had to go along with what his brother decided, no matter what, because that, that was their way of doing it. The head in command gets the final say. And and Lil Yahweh always had the final say. So yeah, exactly. He had to uh, go around him and do things on his own without him knowing. So that's definitely what's going on here. I want to skip ahead to Cain because this is important. Yeah. After uh, after a while, Eve was really suicidal. She she figured, you know, we're out here because. Uh, because of me, and it, Adam would be better off without me. So she leaves him and wanders, going west, crying. And after a while, Satan goes goes up to Eve, and they have sex, and she becomes pregnant with his child. And after a while, uh, she gives birth to Cain, and Cain, Cain and uh, Abel. The uh, the fable in, in Genesis of Yahweh favoring Abel over Cain, that's that has to, uh, to do in part with this story here, because Cain was Satan's son. Who was Abel the son of? Abel was the son of Adam, but Yahweh favored Abel, as everybody knows, and but this caused a split between the races. There was two factions of humans. Uh, and now we're going to jump to the time of the giants because I really would like to tell that story. I haven't done that before. Humans were in two factions, the Cainites and the Sethites. The Sethites were under the rule of Enlil Yahweh uh, around the Zagros mountain range. And the Cainites were of the lineage of Cain. And they were situated in the land that became known as Canaan, which is now Israel. And they were under the rule of Enki Satan. So there was these two, um, this big split, this division between the population. Everybody, when when we talk about the giants, of course, everybody knows Genesis 6, uh, the verse there. There were giants in those days, mighty men of renown, etc. And everybody loves to quote the book of Enoch also. And how the uh, fallen angels came down and had sex with women and impregnated them and it gave birth to the giants. That's not exactly how it happened. It's the basics, but it, a little more detail uh, gives a little more insight on this. They wanted to go down because obviously they found the people attractive. But the reason that they wanted to go down is because uh, Satan wanted to bestow technology upon his people. He wanted to give them an easier life, uh, which he did. He and his angels actually did that. And that, that was uh, one of the big problems that Yahweh had with him. But they actually asked permission from Yahweh first, the 200 Grigori, as they're called, which is a Greek word for watchers. And these watchers were uh, the Anunnaki of the sky in early uh, Babylonian myth. 
which was about a third of the Anunnaki at the time. So they asked permission from Enlil, and he said, yeah, fine. Uh, and Lucifer knew. He, he knew uh, that it would all fall on him as soon as that happened. There's actually a, a verse. I don't have it with me right here, but it's in the book. Now you said Lucifer, and we're talking about we're using that it's the same as Satan? Yes. Okay, just want to make sure. Okay. And in the in the myth of the fallen angels and the giants, uh, that being split into two personalities, two aspects of Satan, uh, known as Shemyaza and Azazel. And if you read it on its own, it does sound like two were working as one, which is because, like I just said, they are two aspects of the same deity. So I had to conflate the two, which is not, it was not difficult to do. Um, they don't have major roles that were separate from each other. So it was just, uh, it was very easy. And um, it makes sense because they are epithets for Satan. What's the role of the Watchers, Priscilla? You mentioned the Watchers because a lot of people talk about that. Yeah. Are they aligned with uh, Yahweh and Leel or? They were, uh, they were the Luciferians. They were the Anunnaki uh, under Enki, Satan. They were not the Yigi. They were not uh, Yahweh's angels. So yeah, they came down. And one of the things, uh, one of the details which shed some light on this as to why they wanted to uh, breed with them. Humans at that time did not wear clothing at all. They were just walking around naked all the time like animals. So it would be very obvious to see who's attractive and who's not to you. <laughs> you <know. laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyways, yeah, uh, they were not all male. Some of them were female, and uh, even though the women became pregnant, some men had sex with some of the female uh, Anunnaki. So it wasn't it wasn't completely one sided. From these uh, pregnancies, the um, Ethiopian text, the Kebra Nagast, the Ethiopian text, uh, tells us that. Their bellies split open because uh, these creatures were so large. And that could mean a few things. Either they were giants, but there are also what, what are called monsters, quote unquote, which I deduce to be uh, hybrid beings, uh, genetic mutations, uh, deformities, people who don't look very human. Now, when you say their stomach split open due to the pregnancy, I, I lost that. Yeah, the text says that their stomach split open from the pregnancies. Uh, they died because of that, obviously. It was like a forced C-section, spontaneous forced C-section. Not very pretty. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that that's what happened. And um, because of this, we can deduce something. Uh, we can surmise that uh, the DNA of the gods, uh, you know, obviously it was compatible with humans and human embryos, because otherwise that would not have happened. Uh, and also, it was able to mix genetically, but it was not favorable, which is why giants and monsters and hybrids were born unto them. So that tells us that the gods are from here. You know, if we're yeah. able to breed with these beings, that means they are of the earth too. Another one of my thoughts is that this is really amazing stuff because when people think of gods, they think of gods in terms of being infallible, that they don't make mistakes. They're, well, most of the time they think of them as perhaps benevolent, depending upon, I guess, what your upbringing is or what you've been taught. So right. you're painting a picture here that is, it's, it's very different. They make mistakes. They have emotions. They get upset. They have factions. They fight with each other. Like I said before, they're they're like us in yeah. that respect. They were emotional beings too, and everything that comes along with that, naturally. Well, you're going to pop a lot of bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Noah, actually, the hero of the flood, was created presumably by a fallen angel. Noah's father, Lamech, uh, when his sister, Bet-Ninosh, uh, gave birth to Noah, 
He accused her of adultery. He accused her of being impregnated by one of the fallen angels because Noah did not look human. Or I'll, I'll read the verse. In the first book of Enoch, chapter 106, verses 1 to 2, it says, And his body was white as snow and red as a rose, the hair of his head as white as wool, and the didema beautiful. That's like the crown. And as for his eyes, when he opened them, the whole house glowed like the sun. Rather, the whole house glowed even more exceedingly. And then later on in, uh, I believe it's the book of Giants, it says, Then I decided that the conceptions was at the hand of the watchers, that the seed had been planted by the holy ones, or the Nephilim. Now, here, here's one more for you, and then I'll, I'll move on. Um, another Lamex went to his father, Methuselah, and uh, he says to him, I have begotten a strange son. He is not like a human being, but resembles the children of the angels of heaven, and his nature is different. He is not like us, and etc. So this is explicitly stating Noah is not human. He is like them, and which means they are not human. What you about know? Moses when he came back from Mount Sinai? Wasn't I mean the story in the Bible is didn't he yeah. illuminate also? He he did. He was shining as he came down, wasn't he? Right. Yeah. Um, you know that's interpreted traditionally as a, a halo, but I don't know. Uh, I I haven't dissected that myth. Yeah, very, no, it just came to mind much. when you were talking about Noah. I thought to myself, well, I, I know of another story in the Bible where yeah, you talk about illumination. You know, one of the things that comes up uh, over and over in the descriptions of the deities is that they were shining, but they were they were white. Like their skin was so white, it was albino, which is why I came to that conclusion. So when it said uh, his skin shone like the sun, it was just really really bright, you know. Yeah. And the eyes shining also is another attribute because the gods' description, their eyes were always glowing red like flames. So now at this time, bef right before he was born, uh, Enlil Yahweh decided, look, I don't like what's going on here. I don't like that they're getting technology. I don't like that my brother is letting them live as they want. Uh, he's not killing people for being deformities. He's letting them live their lives. And I can't have this. So he actually plots that he, he has a count on 120 years until I extinguish them. So there was a plan right from the start. He said, actually, the first thing he wanted to do was bring a flood. That was his first thought. But, you know, let, let's see where this goes first. So there was 120 years to go before the flood came. So he gave uh, Enki, Satan, 120 years to basically get it the way Enlil or Yahweh wants it. Otherwise, yeah. I'm wiping it out. Exactly. So um, He's a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was in, it's actually stated the 120 years in the Book of Giants and the Kebra Nagast. Okay. We have corresponding uh, references there. So we have the Cainites and the Sethites under different rule. And the Cainites were living pleasurably, leisurely because of the technology. So Yahweh Enlil goes to Namtar. Uh, which is the god of plague, and he says, cut off the food supply, make the fields uh, choke with salt, and uh, let Adad, the storm god, withhold the rain. So that's what happened. The fields dried up. People didn't have a food supply. It didn't rain to give them a food supply. So they began to starve. And the starvation, there was a six-year period uh, according to the Babylonians, uh, in which things got worse and worse because of this. In the, That was the first year. In the second year, people had a chronic itch. The storehouses of food and uh, supplies were depleted. In the third year, people became malformed and discolored from starvation. In the fourth year, deformities started to show. Uh, by the fifth year, people were selling their children for whatever food they could get. But by the sixth year, they were eating their own kids. They were so desperate, they were cannibalizing each other. Wow. 
Yeah. So you know what's interesting uh, about this, Priscilla, is not to interrupt yeah. you again, but it's like they have a like a corporate structure there. You know, you have Yahweh in the CEO's office and he rings the intercom and he says, <laughs> Bring the plague god in, okay? <laughs> <laughs> You have to get something done here. So it's very interesting that there's this organization. That's how it's coming across to me. There's this pecking order, this hierarchy. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, it's, uh, again, I keep saying it's very interesting. It is. It's, it's incredible. Some of the gods didn't like it. Guess who? Enki. And so the uh, Pantheon Major held a council about what was going on. And Enlil just says, hey, I want, I want everybody destroyed. I want to bring a flood and Enki is going to be the one that does it and he makes the gods take an oath of secrecy for this plan and Enki didn't want any of it he said how dare you try to use my hand to to destroy my beings you know my creation and so you know obviously he defies him in that way so after the council Enki goes to Noah, Atrahasis. There's other episodes for him, Zarathustra. Sorry, Zarathustra. He goes to Atrahasis and he says, destroy your house and build a boat. Don't worry about riches. You need to do this right away. And he uh, drew a design for him, like a blueprint. He says, Here, here's how you do it. And the Ark... Uh, was made into nine compartments, and it was a cube in form. It wasn't a boat like Ken Ham has built in Kentucky. That's nonsense. It was to be, the dimensions were to be equal on all sides. That's what the text says. And different texts give different specific measurements. But the, I think it was the Epic of Gilgamesh said it has to be equal on all sides, and this was the original story. It was a cube. Yeah, it was okay. a cube split into nine sections, and uh, there was actually a crystal suspended to give a light source, some kind of crystalline technology that we don't know about. Some people speculate that Atlantis used crystalline technology, too. I don't know how that would work, though. Um, but you got to think, you know, how did they see? Because if they burned a fire, uh, getting tossed and turned around with, you know, floodwaters throughout the whole world, you're not going to be able to sustain a fire in the ship. And also, if you do, what about the carbon monoxide? That would suffocate everybody and kill them. So it had to have been an artificial light source. So it was built and there was a a clock that Enki uh, provided him to, so that he could keep track of the time he had left because there was only seven days to get this done uh, because that's they were really on a tight schedule. And after a few days of building, Adam and Eve's uh, daughter, Noria, comes along and says, I want a place on this boat. I know what you're doing. And he says, no, I can't do that for you. And so she sets it on fire and burns it down. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he had to, yeah. So he had to start <laughs> over and he only had a few days left. And he warns the elders of the village and people come to help. And he has this giant crowd of people there. Uh, some are helping, some are wanting a place on the boat, etc. Some are just causing trouble during this time. Uh, and he had to, have, Noah had to have a cover story uh, because he couldn't, he couldn't say, well, you know, this, everybody's going to get destroyed because then everybody, everybody would want a place on the boat. Yeah. So his cover story, which was told to him by Enki, was that he was building a boat to go visit Enki, to go to him because Enlil didn't want him on the surface anymore. And remember, Enki uh, lived in uh, his temple at the bottom of the ocean somewhere. Like I said, there was only a few days left, and he couldn't do it all on his own, even with the help of some people. Uh, so what happened was Enki hid the construction project in a quote-unquote bright cloud. And now cloud is one of the uh, code words for an aerial craft. 
uh, along with others like Chariot and uh, what else? Cloud, Chariot, Baal was set to ride on clouds. He was a cloud rider. There is Yahweh descended in a pillar of cloud. Um, his tabernacle or tent of meeting was kind of described like that. So these are flying so, vehicles. Yeah, this was a flying vehicle. Okay. So that's where the construction uh, was revamped. And angels, quote unquote, helped Anunnaki, uh, helped build it to make it go faster, of course. And once it was completed, uh, Enki provided food. He he provided a banquet every day for them. You know, they were want of nothing during this construction project. He wanted everything to go smoothly. And afterwards, they hold a banquet in celebration. And But uh, Noah was really terrified. He was sick to his stomach with anxiety. Yeah. Uh, after loading all his possessions on board uh, during the banquet, he couldn't eat. Uh, his heart was breaking because he knew what was going to happen. He was vomiting bile also, and he just couldn't stand still. And uh, afterwards, uh, there was a crowd of 700,000 people around the ark, uh, and they wanted to take the ark by force because they were onto him. They were like, you know, something's coming. We know what's up. We don't you know, know what's going to happen. You know, what's interesting to me is that Enlil is not really keeping tabs on his brother here. I mean, you know, he doesn't want him on the surface anymore. In the meantime, Enki is working to get this, this ship built. He's creating banquets. He's making sure they're well fed. And he's making sure that things stay on the, the project plan. Yet Enlil is not, doesn't seem to be keeping an eye on his brother here. So this is another very interesting aspect of this. Yeah, it makes you wonder what, what he was doing during this time. But, yeah. Uh, we can only guess. Yeah, Isn't somebody's there's... going to get fired for not keeping an eye on Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. So um, everybody, his, Noah's family uh, gets in the boat or the ship, the vessel, whatever. It wasn't really a boat. And uh, there was a pilot also that made sure things were okay. His sons, his sons' wives, uh, and a lot of people like to go on about, well, how did he get every animal, two of every animal on the boat? That's impossible. Can't be done. And I agree. Can't be done. Yeah. However, that's not what it says. Uh, it says that in the Bible, but go back further. The Epic of Gilgamesh, the first flood story, it states it was the seed of every animal that was put on board it was a dna storehouse one of the nine compartments was a dna storehouse of every living species and presumably uh enki was the one that gathered this up you know from the time that enlil said okay there's going to be 120 years before this happens that's quite a bit of time to gather up dna yeah you know, and we can imagine he had a team doing that. It wasn't just him. Yeah, we got DNA, which takes care of the animals conundrum. And Noah was apprehensive, of course. And he didn't actually enter the ark until water, rainwater, was knee high. Because he he was, you know, clinging on to hope that it wasn't going to happen. But it was King Og of Bashan which was one of the giants, one of the giant leaders, he didn't want to die. And he said, uh, I'm going to, I will give you whatever you want if I could just hold on to the ark during the flood. And uh, he said, okay, fine. Yeah. And uh, so he did that. And the pilot, he, his wife, Noah, his three sons, their wives, the pilot, his name was Boozer Kurgala. And uh, they all went in, and he sealed it up behind them. They were ready to go. And now, this they... was an advanced vessel, right, Priscilla? I mean, people have in their minds. Oh, yeah. I know you said it's not the ark, so it's not. He's they're not hammering wood together, right? <laughs> so right. this is a very advanced vehicle we're talking about. Let's think about this for a second. If it was a a vessel of wood and pitch, that could get destroyed pretty easily with right. uh, trees and boulders. It's floating around, waves. flying. Yeah. yeah, the waves. Uh, if anybody's seen the movie The Day After Tomorrow, 
you have an idea of what happened because that was a that depicts a global superstorm and that's actually pretty similar to what the texts say it was a global flood it was uh, uh fueled by hurricane winds uh, rain water and um just a lot of uh upheaval for a long time it lasted a whole year so if you have a simple construction a box of wood chances are that's going to get destroyed within a year yeah with everything flying around um so i surmise that it had to have been some other material very advanced yeah 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 uh what that is is anybody's guess it might have been adamantine because that's that's a mythic metal mentioned just a few times uh that could have been it but that's just speculation so before everything uh happened before the waves crashed in the gods enlil uh his cohorts kind of had a little bit of fun the text said that they scorched the earth so it sounded to me like they were just getting in a a quick killing spree for fun before everything came down i think these are the same people that are in charge today <laughs> <laughs> it could very well be <laughs> uh, the behavior has not changed yeah amazing <laughs> so um it was a global flood like i said in jubilees chapter 5 verse 26 for example it said it the water reached 15 cubits over the mountains and it's uh, that's a, also echoed in the jewish hagada text genesis said it was it reached over the mountain tops as well so we have a few sources it's not just genesis saying this so the gods they actually went into orbit while this happened and they watched their civilization get destroyed and everybody on earth and while they were in orbit ninersag she was crying enki uh was in mourning he 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 said he just wanted uh his people to live you know as he watched them die people and animals ran for the mountains ran for the hills they didn't make it of course the flood got them and they drowned like flies in a pool and just imagine this if you were in the middle of that if you had a porthole and you looked out you would see all kinds of debris rock trees earth soil floating around along with dead bodies as far as the eye could see that's that's a pretty horrid image yeah it's unbelievable it really it's a is. nightmare so that's what we were dealing with there and it lasted a whole year the gods uh in orbit didn't realize it was going to last that long and they thirsted and they were hungry but after a year the the tops of the mountains were seen and actually there was 14 islands that appeared and but they uh, eventually settled on mount nimush for 6 days before sending out the dove swallow and raven and everybody knows that so i'm not going to go over that and then after 150 days the water began to recede and that that was stated in genesis chapter 7 verse 24 and afterwards noah and his family were got out of the ark and he made a sacrifice and the gods came down and ki and ninersag and the ones that were with them came down and uh ate the offering the burnt offering and and then enlil finds them and he comes out and he's furious that anybody lived but he does something uncharacteristic uh he instead of killing them he actually translates noah and his wife because they were the survivors and by translate i mean uh apotheosis um he gave them the rank of the gods like one of the angels um so he promoted them he promoted them yeah okay. and noah and his wife uh got taken and he lived with the gods for the rest of his life we don't hear much about him after that except uh right after noah was establishing he and his family were establishing a uh settlement and he found and and this is like really fictional uh coincidence uh that happened he actually sees uh the vine 
that was planted that grew into the tree of knowledge and good of good and evil, uh, which was actually during the construction of Eden was planted by Satanael, which is Satan, Enki. And he sees this and he becomes very frightened and he doesn't know what to do. Should I plant it? Should I not? And he dwells on it for 40 days. And then he, he finally planted it and Satan shows up and he says, do you need help? And, and he says, sure. So they planted it together and uh, he harvested it. And if you read the Bible, it reads like he planted a vineyard and produced wine. But like I said, going back to the Eden myth, I believe it was a hallucinogenic. So the only drink that we know of that would give you a DMT effect would be ayahuasca. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of the same thing, I think. On the same day, it says he planted it. It bore fruit. He made the drink. He got drunk and he dishonored himself all in the same day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, belligerent, drunk going around naked, talking <laughs> crap. <laughs> wow. Some behavior hasn't changed. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So anyways, after that, we don't really hear a lot about them. How but... did uh, humans repopulate after all this? I mean, he, he goes and he goes and lives with the gods and, you know, he plants his tree with uh, Enki or Satan's help. And then, then what happens? He and his sons, he divided the land amongst his sons, three sons. Um, and the population, they have children, the population grows, etc., etc. And after a long time, uh, the population is booming again. And the story skips to this period of time at the end of Noah's life, uh, right before the Tower of Babel was being built, actually. Because they were around the area of Ararat mountain range, and you know they had to go south and uh, west and east, some of them, which is might actually be the the origins of places like Gobekli Tepe and uh, Katahoyuk and things like this that we read about and hear about, and that that was what eleven twelve thousand years ago. Something like that. But it seems very implausible that his family would would populate the earth to where it is today. I mean, starting when they started, I mean, that would be more than a full-time job. <laughs> right. right, right. But you got to understand uh, a few thousand years, presumably, passed or more because I gave a little example um, in, I think it's the Addendum or the War in Heaven chapter forget which, in my book about dating these events. And I didn't come to a conclusion, but if we were to date these things, if, let's take the flood, for example, uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, each book, each of the 12 books corresponds with the sign of the Zodiac. So if we're going to do it that way, then I would have placed the flood not the last age of Aquarius, but the one before that, because the last age of Aquarius would have been too soon from where we are today. So that would have been roughly around 25,000 years ago that the flood happened. Well, that's just almost the same thing as a great year. I mean, the procession right. of the equinox. Okay. Right. So you got to understand population became what it was by the time the Tower of Babel and uh, the city was built because all that time had passed. It wasn't just a hundred years and we have a few million people again for some reason. You know, you gotta, we have to think uh, more logically about this. So did Enlil mellow out a little bit? I mean, his here looks like it's going to repopulate again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, he was, he was mellow for a while. Uh, there was a lot of disease at the time, the time that the population was growing and uh, he got rid of some of it, and Enki got rid of some of it too. Some but, of the yeah, disease. Some of the disease. Okay, so yeah. he was he was helping out a little bit. A little bit, but okay. he he purposely left uh, ten percent of it behind because he wanted it to be there. Like he didn't want it. He wanted the population to have something to worry about, basically. And uh, I have to tell you, it's a little disconcerting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is. Hear this, you know. It's, it is. It's, uh, I, I know I'm laughing, but I'm kind of laughing in disbelief. It's a little disconcerting to 
to know that there's a God that he really despises. I mean, how else do I say this? He despises humanity. Oh, yeah, he definitely does. He he wasn't really, he was never fond of us to begin with. No, and I'm fast forwarding, yeah. you know, and I'm looking at what's going on today. And it just, we have all the stuff that's interrupting and hurting our mind-body dynamic. It's the GMO foods, it's the flu shots, the vaccines, uh, all yeah. that stuff, you know. So I'm thinking, and, wow, not a whole lot has changed. And, you know, if uh, one of the purposes of my book subsequently of writing it is you know if if enough people read it and this is like a long shot i know but if enough people read it presumably they would come to understand that as the adage goes actions speak louder than words and if we apply these actions uh, that the gods had during this time of these myths what would happen if the world stopped worshiping this despot and this autocrat and started worshiping the God that wanted us, that wanted to save us, that wanted to help us, you know, what would the world be like? You know, if things manifested through uh, spiritual energy being directed in a certain way, wouldn't the world improve? Yeah, but first you'd have to get people away from their indoctrination. Yeah, that's the tricky part. That, that's that's a huge, <laughs> huge problem. I mean, it's a problem oh, yeah. in biblical proportions to get people... <laughs> to understand that the God that they have been worshiping and praying to and going to church to worship every Sunday is the wrong guy. Yeah. You know, I mean, right now there's people listening to this, uh, Priscilla, and, and you and I, I mean, th they would chase us down the streets with uh, torches and pitchforks. So, <laughs> you know, just for having this discussion, just for trying oh. to kind of, you know, reveal this to a certain degree. Tall order. It is. My book is twenty nine ninety nine, and anybody who has that kind of money to spare can know the for themselves. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, you're giving it the old college try, so I tip my hat to you. So, do you want to move on to the Tower of Babel? Yeah, let's move on to the Tower of Babel. And like I said, we have about uh, maybe fifteen twenty minutes, and then we can do a part three. But uh, keep going. I'm gonna get through this quick. So this at this point, this is where uh, the the god Esculapius comes into the scene. He was around during this time, uh, which is very likely to be uh, a relative of Anthe because of his uh, scientific uh, knowledge, his uh, knowledge of healing. He wielded one of those serpentine staffs that uh, Enki is famous for. So anyways, he and 40 other magicians wanted to go to uh, the new Eden. There was a new one erected east of Mesopotamia somewhere. And he wanted to get some of the bark from the tree of life, the tree of knowledge. But when they got there, the sword, the flaming sword, uh, shot lightning and burnt them all to a crisp. So that didn't go so well. There was three kings originally who were like priest kings because they were uh, the intercessors between humans and the gods. The three appointed were Jokan, or Joktan, rather, Fennec, and Nimrod. And Nimrod was the famous one that headed the uh, project to construct the Tower of Babel. He actually became, in later myths, later chronologically, he became the Gilgamesh of the epic. It's the same person. And he was uh, appointed as the greatest king because he was known as a great giant hunter. And in some cases, Gilgamesh is actually described as a giant or somewhat of a giant in stature. So he hunted down the giants? Yeah, okay. he did. He was known for it. And um, so the first governments were hierarchies or hagiocracies. That's what the terms are. And Nimrod was the great grandson of Noah. And after 10 years had passed, of of uh, him being appointed, Noah dies, and there is only one uh, verse in all of mythology concerning this that even mentions Noah's death, which I find to be odd for somebody of such importance to have such a great role. You know, Adam and Eve's death had a, a very long explanation of what happened, but him, he only got one line. I don't get it. But anyways, Nimrod. He stirred things up because he rejected Enlil. 
and he tempted the populace into uh, following Enki and, and, you know, living their life according to his rules, his uh, decrees. The monsters, the hybrids, and the giants helped build the city and the tower. Nimrod oversaw the project. Uh, Marduk stepped in, and he was like a, a project uh, overseer as well, like um, a foreman, I guess. And people, the, the monsters, they didn't, they were not overseen by Enki. Enki was absent during this time. Enlil and Enki both were absent during this time. People were, people, the monsters, the hybrids, the giants, they were all on their own. We don't know what they were doing, the gods, at this time. But they weren't around. And the monsters did something pretty bad. They forced labor upon people. And the text, uh, the Apocalypse of Baruch, I believe it was, described that uh, mothers who were pregnant were forced to make bricks. And they would give birth, and uh, right after giving birth, they would go back and make more bricks. It was pretty terrible, the working conditions. People were enslaved doing this. And this was supposedly in support of Enki. Well, no. Uh, they, You know, Nimrod wanted to build a tower to reach the gods, to, and also uh, the hybrids, they wanted to peer into heaven. They wanted to know what it looked like. Okay, okay, because I thought you said before that Nimrod had aligned himself with Enki. Did I misunderstand that? No, you, you understood that, and he, he did, but Enki was not present. Okay, so they're building this, the tower now, but, but the purpose of the tower is basically to get a glimpse into what it's like in the land of the gods. Right. Which brings up the question, what, why could they not see into the night sky? Was there a, a thick cloud cover? And I think that's what it was. Because uh, as the floodwaters subsided, you know, the atmosphere had to be pretty thick, right? Yep. Because where did all the water go? I hadn't thought about that. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So there's probably a very thick cloud cover, or it was domed. That's another possibility, but that brings up more questions that can't be answered. So I tend to believe it's it was a thick cloud cover. So this is also where Abraham comes into the story during the construction. And he is famous because he was one of the few who uh, would not budge. He, he was aligned with Enlil Yahweh. He would not shake from that stance. He refused to be a slave. He refused to help build the tower. He and his followers uh, were threatened by fire. Um, 84,000 people actually got consumed by kiln fire, the text says. But the ones that survived fled to the mountains. Abraham said he was coming, but he didn't. He, I, I kind of leave it off there because the next... Uh, time we see abraham it's the traditional story in genesis right and everybody is familiar with that so the tower was also an aviary for the gods marduk and enlil enki was to have a place at the top of it uh, which never happened but uh, that was another thing which adds to the theory that the gods were a dragon race because some of them the higher ups had wings and they would be able to fly around presumably you know what's the point of having wings if you can't use them that would be a mean joke <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah nimrod at this time appointed himself as a god and the tensions build between the people and nimrod wanted to wage war against the gods that were in orbit in heaven he was uh declaring war against anu basically. And Anu is the father of Enki and Enlil. And he was the one that uh, resided in orbit. He was the one that oversaw the watchers uh, before they came down. And uh, he stayed up there. And so once the tower uh, was tall enough, which took 43 years to build, uh, it was around 30,000 cubits, which is oh. 15,000 and a half meters tall, uh, which is taller than anything we have today. That's uh, 45,000 feet, right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. 
uh, the Sibylline Oracles describes it at, quote unquote, awful height. That's eight miles in the sky, if I, had, if I do my math correctly. Something like that. Yeah, if I take 45 divided by 5,000, let's just say mm -hmm. 5,000 approximately a mile. It's, wow. Yeah. Eight miles up. Yeah. Uh, 600,000 people were involved building this thing. Um, now, this information, Priscilla, where is this? What is your source for this? Because, I mean, this is a, an amazing amount of detail, the number of people. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, well, the uh, apocalypse of Baruch got into it pretty detailed. The Haggadah, everything is uh, everything is noted in the book, though. Okay. Okay. I was just curious. I cite all my sources, so if anybody has any questions, they can look it up themselves and just see for themselves. So the it was a gate, a gateway of the gods. Babel means gate of God. Bab means gate, and from Elu, which means God. That's the uh, Cadian, I believe. And yeah, they they climbed the tower, and the hybrids took an auger, uh, some kind of piece of equipment, and pierced the thick cloud cover so they could see the heavens. And immediately they started shooting at the at the gods that were up there. The text says that some of the arrows came back with blood on them. You know, they weren't too high up. They weren't beyond their reach. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So Yahweh. So they know. had no idea they were building this thing. So this is another thing that gets me. So you're up there. Oh, I know. <laughs> right. And you're not yeah. checking. You're not doing your job. You're not checking to make sure that the natives. Are not becoming <laughs> restless, right? So yeah, in the meantime, which, they're building a tower that's eight miles in the sky, and none of the, the gods realize this. Yeah, and that, that begs the question, where did they go? Where were they? Yeah. We don't know. Uh, that's one of the questions I hope to answer in the second book. There is a lot of questions left unanswered in, in this story, so I am on, I'm on a quest to find them. No, it, it's amazing work. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that perturbed them. So Yahweh Enlil and 70 of his angels retaliate. And he specifically throws what I conclude to be a thermonuclear warhead at the tower. Two-thirds of it were obliterated, fell down, and a third remained standing. But in one shot, he made it fall. So other... Uh, Textual uh, material said that uh, some of the people that were on the tower when it blew up got turned to ghosts, to phantoms. Some of them reverted back to apes, and some of them um, became deformed. So what does that tell us? It tells us, well, of course they died. Something would have had to have happened to deform people from that explosion, and that would be nuclear fallout. Now, this is where what's called the chains of Satan, the nets of iron and bronze, were being prepared. And this is where we come to the war in heaven because tensions were building. Nimrod claimed himself a god because he was overseeing this tower project. It got destroyed, and this triggered what's known as the war in heaven. In Greek, it was the war of the titans. This is the same war. It took 10 years there was uh, millions and millions of people and gods and goddesses involved. This is also where the concept of Atlantis fits in, because there was uh, corresponding verses uh, between Critias, what he said of Atlantis sinking and being destroyed, and what Enoch said about this, uh, about this war. Enoch states that Sheol, or it's the name of the underworld, opened up and swallowed the armies. And Critias said that uh, when Atlantis sank, the warrior force sank below the earth all at once. So this is making me think this is uh, uh, the telling of the war between Atlantis and Lemuria, perhaps. And then we have to say, well, Who's, who's Critias is Athens and who is the Atlanteans? This is something that I want to get into more and uh, solve mystery of in the second book. Absolutely amazing, Priscilla. Now, I, I know in the last discussion, the first one we had, that you said, I, did you say you were researching this for 10 years? Yeah, I've, uh, I started on this in, well, 
I got into mythology in 2002. And after years of reading books and trying to make sense of things, I, I came to the conclusion that Lucifer is a good guy. All the evidence seems to point in that direction. That was the whole purpose behind this book that I wrote. I just wanted to prove that he was the good God. The further in I got, the further in I realized the subject of Lucifer encompasses more than himself. It encompasses everything. Yeah. And the book became what it is today. I tip my hat to you because the material for you to learn all this, the material that you had to research and, and read and plow through, that's a lot of very dense material. I mean, you have to oh, have yeah. a lot of patience. You have to be very, very persistent to stay with it. So obviously, it's an area that you love. Otherwise, you would not have pursued it the way you did. Oh, yeah, of course. I spent the better part of my 20s reading books rather than going out to parties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I just turned 34. I had my uh, birthday on the 12th of this month. So I'm fairly young. Uh as far as you know, people in this field doing this kind of research goes. Have you ever bumped into others that have done this research that want to debate you on what you have written or your positions or you haven't had that? No, I, I haven't had that yet. Okay. No. no one has presented an argument for it yet. We need to probably do a part three, yes? Yeah, sure. That would yeah. be great. Uh, we could. We basically covered the whole story in a very nutshell way. We could uh, do a part three and get into the epithets and uh, mythological connections of identifying the deities. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. I I've learned a lot, and uh, I, I apologize for some of my questions, but... Um, oh, no, that's totally fine. You know, I wanted to make sure that I was staying, I was tracking with you so that the audience would also track, but... Uh, Look, as just like the first time we had the show, I just want to tell you that uh, the work is fantastic. I am going to buy the book as soon as we disconnect here. I will order it from Amazon. And uh, I really appreciate you coming back, and we'll do part three. It will probably be within maybe an, a couple of months, if that's okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Give it a little time, get this show out, get it to, uh, to get some traction, and then we'll follow up maybe in January or February or so. That sounds good. Okay. I like that. All right. Well, Priscilla, it's a pleasure, and uh, thank you so much for, for connecting again, and uh, we will talk soon. Thank you for having me on. I, I really enjoyed it. You're very, very welcome. Bye-bye, Priscilla. All right. Take care. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless.